What if your private practice was a space for your healing and growth too? What if we could move our practices from a stress-driven business model to a practice that grows as we thrive? What if we become courageous leaders and agents of change through our practices? Join us as we explore the journeys of inspiring psychologists who are healing through private practice. Hello and welcome to the Inspiring Psychologist podcast. And in this episode, we are talking about your financial well-being in private practice and how we can shift our relationship with money in our private practice. We're going to delve into this complex relationship that psychologists and therapists tend to have with their finances, and with the whole topic of um, how we relate to money and earning money and making money in our private practices. And what I hope is that by the end of this conversation, we can have some insights on how we can nurture a healthier and more empowering approach to thinking about how we earn money as psychologists and therapists. I think this is such an important topic for us to discuss in private practice because our relationship with money is one of the very first challenges that we come across when it when we contemplate even having a private practice. You know, questions like will I earn any money? You know, they cut right to the existential kind of um center of our practice. They're also one of the first things we have to tackle when we think about things like, will I get any clients? How much am I going to charge them? Um, how, what does my business model look like? What does my business plan look like? You know, money is really at the heart of that. And I think it's also one of the biggest challenges we have in our private practice. So when we think about where all the messages and the ideas that we get about money come from. You know, there's a lot of stuff there that comes down to our family of origin, you know, intergenerational burdens, um, also the culture and even the class that we've perhaps uh, grown up in. Um, and I, I feel like private practice is also, uh, sorry, financial well-being in our private practice is also one of the most enduring challenges because it never really goes away. You know, it follows us through the ups and downs of our private practices. And so for me, when I'm thinking about um, the healing potential of private practice, because of the size and scale and scope of our challenges around earning money and financial well-being, it feels as though this is potentially even an enormous um, area of potential for us to um, heal from, you know, some of those messages or some of those burdens that we've picked up. And it can be incredibly empowering to develop a different relationship with money, with finances, with earning money. Um, by um, by kind of thinking about this this whole topic. So today on the podcast, I'm welcoming two guests. First of all, I'm going to be joined by Dr. Matt Cunliffe, who is a chartered sports and exercise psychologist who specialises in high, high performance mindset and coaching. And Matt and I have had multiple conversations because he also lectures men and mentors aspiring sports psychologists who are setting out on their careers. And, you know, this topic of how to earn money as a sports psychologist is, is also, you know, a central topic for them too. And later on in the podcast, we'll be joined by Andrea Rotundo, who is a specialist in supporting therapists in private practice to gain simple but powerful knowledge from the numbers in their business. Andrea started out as a psychology graduate and is a military spouse. And so she was moving around a lot and therefore she set up Liquid Sense Bookkeeping to help therapists in their private practice to feel more empowered about the story that the numbers were telling them. And so I think that's a really interesting way of 
perhaps feeling more empowered. So uh, with with all that said, I'd like to welcome Dr. Matt Cunliffe, first of all, to the podcast. Hey, Wendy. How are you doing, Matt? Hey, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really good, thanks. Um, how are you doing? Very well. It's good to see you. It's good to be on this uh, podcast episode. Thanks for thanks for volunteering. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. It's good to um, it's good to chat again. It's been a uh, been a bit of a while yeah. since you've had a good chat. So yeah, it'd be good. To it chat. is exactly. So first of all, I wanted to ask you about like a little bit of your own story about you know becoming a chartered sports and exercise psychologist and then about setting up your own business and you know this story of financial well-being how it kind of played out in your um in your own life yeah okay so i i started practicing as a sport and exercise psychologist straight from my master's degree um 2012 that was um so we go through the kind of stage two process um, yes. And that's when I started the stage two process in 2012. I finished it in 2014, 2015, something like that. Um, and there's no, in reality, in, in sports psychology specifically, there's there's not really any official jobs. So there there is certain jobs with teams and there's certainly now, there's much more in the way of advertised positions in um in national teams a lot of the time uh, and and international teams ultimately professional sport and international sport um but lower down the levels for people who are just training or just come out of their master's degree the likelihood of somebody getting that kind of role is pretty low so in, in essence we pretty much as sports sites have to go into independent practice almost straight away so it's in order to get your chartership in order to get your chartership so yeah you can't um, right there's the, you can't uh, you can't get the chartership without clients you can't get clients without having an independent practice unless you right. are, you know it's very rare for somebody to get a job straight out of a master's degree working with um working with either like the uk institute of sport or team great britain paralympics or something. yeah so i went through chartership yeah. as an independent practitioner i started up straight away um yeah going through this idea of trying to get clients as a 22 year old so um <laughs> fresh out of master degree literally no business business knowledge whatsoever I've never been been in business at all so i had to learn everything from scratch um, yeah. and i made a good chunk of mistakes throughout i mean i still make them but um i make a made a good chunk of mistakes at the beginning for sure in terms of kind of understanding it to get how we get clients and actually it yeah. took me until when was the covid pandemic so that was what 2021 2020 2020 so 2020 it really, started yeah took me really until sort of 2020 2021 until i really started getting comfortable with what i was doing what i was offering my clients what value i was bringing to the table i think we had a conversation around then as well yes um, yeah. There was a few other bits and pieces that I was thinking about in terms of like I came across a um, really cheap training course thinking about what your psychology curriculum is like. Um, you know, I started looking at things like DBT, dialectical behavior therapy, and the kind of structure that a curriculum that was presented within DBT was um, mm. was starting to kind of trigger some thoughts around how do I package all of this up into something that looks coherent and people will buy and know what they're getting from me yes um, and it took it took a lot of brainstorming um and a lot of time thinking about how that would come together and and really classify what what i do for or, or how I kind of help people or what I can almost uh I don't like to tend to use the word guarantee but what I can sort of show that you're going to be able to do once you finish working with me yeah um, definitely and it took a long time yeah. to get to that point so yeah I think that's pretty much that's kind of my yeah. journey until now so when when you were kind of starting out as a as a 22 year old and as you said you know making all those mistakes 
Can you recall what, I mean, it's not that long ago, right? And when I say, can, can you recall, it's kind of 10, 10 years ago or so. Yeah, it's so me, it's not yeah, like, um, it's been... you know, when you get really old like me, Matt, and it's like 30 years ago that well, you were. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, you know, thinking about when you were starting out like that and, you know, what messages had you received about that situation you were going into that, you know, there's no jobs for you, so... Have at it, Matt. Yeah. yeah uh, so that was definitely one of the messages. The uh, that that the it's it's going to be hard. And to be perfectly honest, when I have trainees come through, I'm now trainees come through now. I'm very very clear on how difficult it is to to start start out I, as a new business. Um, and I'm very mm. clear with people that that finding clients to work with is probably going to be your biggest challenge as a as a newly qualified or even a sort of a new trainee sports psychologist um so yeah that was definitely one of the messages that i was given um charging for your work you know where yes do you even... should you charge well or can you I, not charge though <laughs> the ridiculousness of this so i have a, i have very very strong opinions on this and i've been very awesome very vocal in the profession for many many years on should we charge and how much should we charge so my my flat response to this is we should not be doing voluntary work as uh, as train especially as trainee psychologists because you know they can't afford it anyway right <laughs> like, like, yeah yeah um i think i think your pro bono work should be done by your senior psychologists who have the time and have the um, sort of financial financial backing to do that pro bono work um, to give back to their communities, um, and and I think the, the kind of junior psychologist should be, uh, and the newer psychologist neophyte should be, um, should be certainly charging from their work from day one. Um, I genuinely, uh, I've had this argument with loads of people over the years that it devalues our profession. Um, yeah. I think I think it devalues yeah. the work that a sports psychologist does. Um, I mean, sports notorious for badly play, p- badly paying their sports scientists anyway. Yes, um, but yeah, we, very few people who are like at the absolute top of the pyramid for yeah. kind of earnings in sport anyway. <laughs> yeah, the, it's, it's sports science it, absolutely the, the the top of the top of the triangle is you know is very small. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'm very vocal on this that we should be charging for our work. The at the minimum, if we're going to do unpaid work, then there has to be something else that we're getting out of it. Um, mm. And it can't just be done for the sake of doing it. So, um, but that, you know, that the message that I got when I started, going back to your original question, you know, it was, we do unpaid work. We, you know, we don't get paid for our work. You yeah. know, I, I came across some people who were senior academics, senior sports psychologists in the profession, who were doing work for free and I was sitting there going like how how can you justify well the, the way they justify it is by being academics right is by by working at a yes. university and then that's the that's the kind of way that they pay their bills and yeah um yeah. And, they, and, they and did you know back then when you were hearing those messages, like what was the impact that those messages had on you? Did it change your mind or were you already feeling like, you know, I'm not buying that? Yeah, I mean, I don't buy it. I, I, I certainly don't buy it now. And I've kind of, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily say I didn't buy it then. I'm, I'm not too sure where I sat with it because I wasn't, certainly didn't have the, the strong opinions about it now that I do. Um, but I always went out and aimed, I always went out and charged for my work, even if it was a small nominal amount. It was always there was always a, a, a fee that was attached to the work. Um, and then I compare it to kind of, sign a com- kind of some of my colleagues who didn't charge for their work early on. Um, mm. And you kind of we both ended up almost at the same place. We're both, you know, qualified. Or, or But, you know, did they get better experiences early on because they were potentially willing to give it away for no no money or, or did i get better experiences because i was adamant about those boundaries it's hard to kind of wait look back and weigh it up but um but certainly it was a it was a discussion that was being had yeah yeah definitely so um i guess i'm when i think back to you know how 
private practice was positioned for me as an occupational psychologist. Um, I fully did ne or never wanted to go into private practice. Like if you'd have asked me at the age of 21, 22, are you going to run your own business? I'd have been like, no way, not ever, not a chance. Yeah. It, which I say that now and it's like wild to me, but I know that that was not on the cards for me because I had very particular kind of experiences growing up with parents that had no money about getting a secure job. And the idea of, you know, still, I mean, I was leaving my master's degree in 1996 and the idea of um, going into and having, a, you know, a secure job and a job for life and these kinds of things was still quite a, a kind of positive thing mm. that you could sign up for. Um, and so I ended up going into my private practice um, for different reasons. One, because... I'd found that working in organizations could be quite toxic because I also wanted more balance for being able to raise a young family. And because we were, we were also going to move overseas and I'd run out of kind of promotion opportunities working for the Ministry mm. of Defense for seven years, you know, there, there were just not that many other roles to go to. Um, and so I, I had no clue how to make a practice work where I could earn money. But I'm, I'm kind of curious from your experience, was there anything like in your background that was influencing your perspective on going into private practice and earning some money? No, um, it was pretty much the only option that was available, right? So there wasn't, um, I mean, I definitely got the same messaging around secure jobs and job security and all, all things like that. Um, I don't tend to play well with other people um, is, is kind of um, kind of the, <laughs> the, the way I, ro I, I roll most days. And, and I think Nikita talks about um, like having an Nikita unemployable Mikhailov, um, Yeah, he talks uh, about having a, a colleague um, of ours. An, uh, an unemployable personality. I think he's got that in his new yes. book. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I thought that yeah. was quite funny when he said that. But um, I certainly yeah, I, find find that... I um, resonate with that as well. <laughs> I enjoy it, yeah. I enjoy the freedom that we have in private practice. I enjoy mm. I enjoy the fact that I can always make more money, right? So if, if there's always that opportunity somewhere to do something that is going to allow me that, that financial freedom, yeah. you know, if I do find that... I've got something coming up or I want to do something, I can go, well, okay, what, what project or what, um, what, what product can I put together that can allow me to earn the money to do that? So um, I kind of yeah. use, yeah, use the yeah. kind of freedom and creativity of private practice to kind of allow me to do things, um, mm. which I found quite nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in, in terms of my background, like I said, I went through university. I was a sport coach through university. Um, I worked for the ambulance service for a little while. Um, had that job. That, I mean, that's that's a job, right? Working <laughs> yeah. twelve-hour shifts, four days a week is is in, is is tough, um, and yeah. uh, certainly something I, I I would never go back to. Um, yeah, yeah. So, in terms of my background, not so much, but there's certainly way more benefits to doing it. That I find than than to not. Yeah, definitely. Well, I'd like to welcome to the podcast now Andrea Rotundo, and she's um, uh, hi, Andrea. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you. Hi. So, Andrea, we were just talking about our kind of backstories a little bit, and this, um, you know, this whole topic of how we come into um, small businesses and the kind of messages that we receive around either earning money in a small business or earning money as a psychologist. But also, could you, I gave a little bit of um, an introduction to you at the start of the podcast, but uh, could you, for the benefit of listeners, kind of unpack that a little bit more? Because obviously, um, you know more about you than me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Um, as you were saying, I, I am a business owner as well, a small business owner. And through my business, what I do is I help private practice owners uh, 
to create systems for their finances so that it can be something that kind of just runs on its own and it can be flexible to grow. Like Dr. Matt was saying, like, if I want to make more money, I can make more money. And sometimes that looks different avenues or different streams of income within your practice. So creating those systems from the get-go or at any given point to allow the flow of money to Mm. Be to be able to give you the information that you need, because the thing with financial systems is yeah. that people, especially in private practice, where it, the money talk is not really a talk. It's kind of like it just happens, you know. Like, sure, you are going to private practice to make money, but there's no coaching around finances or creating your business. It's just it's just a given, but there's no direction on how to do mm. that. So when you create those systems, yeah. uh, like I said, from the beginning or any given point in your journey in your practice, then you're able to get the result of that, which is to see how you're managing your finances. Because if there's no tracking, yeah. if there's no understanding at your level as the owner, there's no way for you to understand which areas you're being really good at and to perpetuate those or to see what areas you're lacking and we have to address them and we have to change them because the goal is profit, but then what else is beyond that? It's not just the profit is what that profit gives you. And that is so unique to everybody. So again, creating those systems yeah. can, in a matter that it's flexible enough to incorporate what you want for your practice. Yeah, and I remember our first conversation, Andrea, because um, we, uh, I think I pinged you a, a message over LinkedIn yeah. or something because you were talking about empowering private practice owners in their relationship with their numbers in their practice. And I just loved that positioning. One, it's a really great positioning. And the other thing was there is so much of this that is about the relationship we have either with numbers mm -hmm. and maths and, you know, those kinds of topics, finances, it involves, you know, all these complicated spreadsheets and things. Some of us are more complicated, uh, confident with that than others, right. but then just, you know, tying elements of our self-esteem, our self-identity, what we like to spend our money on. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of confronting when you see that in the numbers, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Like the the black, the black the numbers are so black and white. It's a list of categories with numbers next to them. And the funny thing about it is that we tend to think that we made more than what we really did. And then we think that we tend to think that we spend less than what we really think. And coming, you know, <laughs> having those numbers in front of you and you're like, oh, that's a lot. Or in some cases, and, and you can, you guys can tell me if I'm wrong, from, from, my, from my experience, I rarely, if never, see a private practice owner that is spending lavishly and then, you know, just frivolously and shamelessly. It's this, it tends to be the other way. It tends to be, I don't want to spend. I'm going to save all my money. I haven't paid myself. And that is also very confronting because from that you can ask yes. yourself, why am I doing this? You know, why am I not paying myself? Why? It just can go so many layers underneath that. Mm -hmm. And again, it's all because of those numbers in front of you and having to get or getting to those numbers tends to be what pushes people away from that because it's that process of setting, setting things up and doing the math, you know, math, even though it's not complicated math, people are like, I don't want to do this. I'm not good at numbers. And the mistake is that people think that because you're not good with numbers and you're not good with math, with, with money. And it's two completely separate things. Right. Mon money is money and yes. math is math. Sure, it's numbers, but it's <laughs> yeah. two different skills. And just because you were not good yeah. with math in school or you don't like math doesn't mean that you're not going to be good with money at all. It's like I said, it's a different mm. thing. So in a way that is very empowering, like you were saying, and motivating in a way like, oh, okay, you know, I can still be bad at math. 
but I can stick, but I can be good with my money. Yeah, yeah. So I noticed, Matt, you were kind of nodding as, as Andrea was speaking there. Are, are there any aspects of what she was uh, talking about that kind of strike a, a bone for you? <laughs> um, I, I, there was a few things in there around um, sort of you never come across a psychologist that's spending lavishly, right? I thought that was quite a, quite an interesting point. I think we generally, as a profession, we're quite, quite um, sort of... I find psychologists quite anxious a lot. I don't know if anyone like we're we're quite a cautious bunch, let's say. Um, yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's fair to say. I think we're we're reasonably cautious as a group. Um, I think I that think was... we get sent a lot of messages about safety. Um, yeah. So when you think about you know all the ways in which we're supposed to practice safely, keep our clients safe. You know, there's a lot of this kind of stuff around boundaries that mm. is about monitoring and, um, you know, monitoring boundaries and, and looking after boundaries. Yeah. And I think from that, we that can kind of maybe even with the additional kind of stories that we absorb around money can kind of hype up the anxiety mm. a little bit about yeah. it. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that would that would resonate pretty well. <laughs> Yeah. So, Andrea, for you, how come you got into this business? Mm, I love that question. I there's two sides of it. So, growing growing up, I always helped my dad with his business. So, looking at money and the movement of money was never something that made me nervous. It made me think that right that I can do that. And as I was going to school for psychology, my goal was actually to uh, be a psychologist and then plans had to change. I realized that I was really good at managing finances and it was something that I would love to be in a position to help somebody else because I felt that way. I know that finances is one of the biggest reasons for conflict, whether it's with your partner or with your business partner or the reason yeah. why finance, why businesses fail. So I knew that I had that skill and that I could present it in a way that it's approachable, that is not somebody looking down at you and yelling at you. I had some recently somebody told me my last bookkeeper was yelling at me for 20 minutes for not knowing this. And I was like, unacceptable. Holy moly. Unacceptable. I would never do that. So kind of like grouping those skills and what I wanted to do uh, because I'm very much mission driven as well like cheesy and you know like I want to leave the world better than I find it that I found it kind of thing I merged that. that's still the psychologist yes, spirit yes right? and just wanting to serve <laughs> somebody else and that like snowball effect of if I help you be better at managing your finances you're going to show up better for your clients, you're going to go home and not have to worry about that. I pay my bills. Will I have enough? Because it's all related to each other, especially with private practice owners that the pay that they get from there is what they bring home. Some of them have partners, some of yeah. them don't, but it's still, that's part of their livelihood and how they make their living. So I knew that I wanted to help this group of people because I love the, the the service that you provide. So from the get go, when I decided that this is what this is what I was going to do, uh, I had this industry in 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 mind, and I never looked back because when I started doing it, I understood like I heard from first yeah. you know from clients and from people like conversations like this. Hey, we're struggling with this. We don't know. This makes us anxious. That can't, that, is, that is a word that I hear all the time. Money makes me anxious. Uh, yeah. And I knew, like, I was sold. I was like, I I'm in the right place. I think this is what I want to do. So, and here I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fabulous. And, and what do you think it is? So, Matt, you also mentioned um, the, the anxiety thing that perhaps – as professionals, maybe there's something about us and something about our professional training as well, perhaps. You know, what is it 
that makes our financial well-being and our relationship with money a challenge for psychologists and therapists? So, you know, is it is it more of a challenge for us than others? What do you think? Matt, I'm going to come to you and jump on you. Mm. <laughs> um, what, what do I think makes it challenging? Okay. Um, I don't, I think we certainly don't talk about it in our training. I mean, yes. I, I know for a fact that, you know, I, when I teach our MSc sports psychology students, we very, very, very rarely talk about the business aspect of um, like being a psychologist. We talk a lot about how to use a therapeutic model, how to use CBT, MI, how to use, um, you know, uh, a theory or whatever. And we talk, talk a lot about how to do presentations and write essays, but very rarely do we talk about, you know, how to do some marketing. Um, and actually, the marketing training that I have done through uh, through the various organisations or that has been set up by various organisations mm-hmm. has been mostly an academic talking about theories of marketing, um, right. which um, was about as useful as you can imagine it to be perfectly honest i've never been to one of those kind of i think the best conversation i ever had was with you wendy and then that kind of kind of drove a lot of the the decisions i made moving forward um so i don't think it's covered at all in training especially in the training that i've been through um, and also, but, I mean, it's so fundamental. And you're, I mean, I love how you yeah. put your finger on it there because in our master's degrees and in our training, I mean, the, you know, I'm sure it's the same in the US, Andrea. Like, this training costs us a bunch of money, right? Like, we know how much the training is costing us. And yet, we don't talk about how to value our services and how to turn that value into a financial income. And that is, that's like the other mm. side of the equation. And yet we don't talk about sure. it. And, and and on top of that, how do we take somebody from an initial contact through that process to the sale at the end, and then the continued yes. working from that, yet we are right. experts in behavior change. And pretty much our entire job is to take somebody from point A to point B wow. where change happens. No I, know excuse. You, I know you've worked through the is the trans theoretical model, Wendy, in, in some of the work yeah. that, works that you've done. And I, I talk about that in motivational interviewing all the time. And you sit and go, Well, we're experts in this, yet we we maybe feel a bit uncomfortable in using it in that sphere. And mm. and the second part of your question was around you know, is this more is this a problem for other professions as well, or is this just a psychology problem i've had so many conversations with like execs and organizations and you know if you give some some of the people in sort of hedge funds and stuff that i've worked with if you offer them a free sample of something they they just think it's not very good they're just not interested they want to pay for it Mm. they 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 expect things to cost money if they are good quality so you know if you're if you are offering quality they're expecting a similar price tag to hit that to to come across with that um and that was one of the biggest learning curves i went through yes yeah in fact um i can speak to that as well andrea what about you in the usa context i mean i know in the uk i think one of the things that comes up for us generally as psychologists is that that there is a a bit more of a relationship with this idea of, um, you know, because of the National Health Service, that especially our clinical and counselling colleagues um, initially train within the NHS and then they, you know, they have this ideal around universal provision of mental health care, Mm -hmm. uh, which is free at the point of, of service. And so I think some of that in our culture comes into our practices mm. where we feel like we should be able to provide at least therapeutic support without people having to pay for it up front. Mm. Um, and I know that there's different um, setups within the US, but for for you, how do you see that kind of, you know, is there a particular challenge for psychologists and therapists in the US in terms of their profession and their values and so on. Yeah, I think what Dr. Matt was correct that in school you're not learning those skills. There's no conversation mm. about 
this is what you're learning and this is how you're going to put it into practice in the business perspective. And I yeah. heard from many different uh, therapists and psychologists say that what they hear in the in their from their professors or from colleagues is that you don't go into this profession to make money. That's kind of like the concept right. that they receive. So even before you're yeah. actually practicing, you're hearing from different people that you look up to that are your mentors saying things like, well, if you want to make money, you're in the wrong place. You should do something else because there's no money in this. So no, not only you, you're you starting from a lower or from, from a different starting point because you already know or you have been told that you can't make money here or that you won't mm. make money here. And both of those yeah. concepts are already bringing you down are already holding you back are already putting a limit on what you want to do there's no conversation about setting up your fees usually somebody is working in an agency and then they start their own practice and they think that their revenue goal should be the same but then it's kind of like the anatomy right. of the fee it's so different if you're an employee than if you're the business owner because now you have other expenses yeah. taxes are different so there's more that should go on top of that fee that you were previously getting paid kind of like on an hourly basis. And also the different cultural backgrounds that we have. There are so many cultures uh, mixing uh, around me and even myself, I am an immigrant. I, I was born in Ecuador. I moved to the US when I was a teenager. The concepts and the experiences that I had growing up with money in a way are so different than here in the United States that it kind of puts me at a disadvantage because I'm starting behind. I'm already like my starting point is different from somebody else. And because we have yes. so many different cultures and again, so many different beliefs that are rooted in the cultures that, that surround us, that will also play an impact because you feel responsible depending on on how you grow up or the expectations that that your family has mm. for example from you well if you make more money than somebody else in your family you're you're the one that we will go to for any need yeah or even if they wouldn't yes. necessarily go up to you and ask you you feel that responsibility so then again that's another point to bring into the, the making the money should I should I make money because then I feel guilty that I'm making more than somebody else or yes. uh, because of the the usually like you were saying before you're very cautious but as but also very giving so if somebody next to you needs something is so hard this is also that I've what I've seen is it's very hard for therapists to say no <laughs> No, I'm not going to lower my fee. This is my fee. So there is scaling, yeah. um, sliding scales for people that can't afford the service where you don't see that yeah, anywhere yeah. else. I I mean, there, there, I'm sure that there could be other places, but I don't, I haven't gone personally to a doctor that will tell me how much can you afford today? Okay. Pay me what you can. Quite. <laughs> that is common with therapists over here. So I think that it's just these like money stories that that are part of all of us, whether you're a therapist or not, but because of those concepts that are being told also as you're preparing to become mm -hmm. a, a therapist, I think that that even solidifies that even more in putting that limit as yeah. to how much you can or should make and could even potentially yeah. even shame you if you are one of the therapists that is charging more uh, it's kind of like oh you're, yeah. you're not a real psychologist at least again that's what i've i've been told or heard from other psychologists in the space yeah yeah definitely i know matt um when we were talking earlier about expectations that trainees coming out of their master's degrees who are still doing their chartership process which is a little bit like the licensing process uh in the usa um 
you know, there there's an expectation Matt was describing that around um, offering services for free. And Matt, you were saying it should be the inverse. It should be the people who are, <laughs> if it's going to be anybody, why not the you know more senior people? Why the trainees who have to come out and mm. um, and kind of you know offer things for for free in order to get experience? So, Matt, when we're thinking about um, these kind of money stories coming into uh, practice and that idea of shaming and how much should you earn? Did you see, have you seen any reflections of that kind of discussion also in the area of sports and exercise psychology? I'm really curious about that, whether it's across all areas of psychology or if it's concentrated in specific areas. Well, I've, I, I, it's, it's go even worse than that. I had, um, I had an assessor for one of my supervisees give some feedback to say that they shouldn't even be doing one-to-one -one work at the moment. And I'm sitting there going, how is this even a thing? I mean, don't get me wrong. I went back to the accrediting organization and queried this yeah. because I thought that's absolutely insane. So like, even to the point where there's certain areas of this where you, you're kind of saying, well, we shouldn't even be doing it. And I'm, I'm just, I was just staggered by that. I really was. Um, so, yeah, I think there's still, there's a lot of this. So well. lots of shoulds, lots of to toxic beliefs oh, around yeah. you should or shouldn't. Um, yeah, loads That's of not it. kind of rooted in. Any founding You know, issue. safety is, right. You know, yeah, even, yeah. You know, we've got life coaches and, you know, people who haven't gone through quite as much training as what, what our, our, even our sort of MSc grads have been through. Um yeah, doing way more stuff than what than what they would be would be would be getting up to with a with an up with a yes. sort of a Saturday league football player or a netballer or a volleyball team. So yeah, there's lots of this should. There's lots of you know should you be charging? I get it even now, right? I, I'm I'm probably at the higher end of the fee market for sports psychologists, um, and I'm in I'm i'm in danger of pricing myself out of the supervision market mm. um mm. if i if i raise my prices any higher um because i'm probably at the top end of the fees for, as a supervisor as well but I, I don't actually make any money off of supervision like i, right. I supervise yeah. other psychologists i don't actually make any money yet i'm already yeah close to pricing myself out of the market for it so yeah you know that's a it's an interesting point to consider that we we have in sports psychology is this idea that you know people are charging almost half of what, I, what i'm charging and whether they're given the same quality or the same amount of service i, I don't know but or, or whether they're given the same level of contact or support i'm not sure but um yeah there's certainly lots of this toxic beliefs and negative thoughts around charging and fees and finances and even doing yeah. the work itself weirdly oh interesting In what way <laughs> well the the idea that we you know trainees oh, shouldn't the... be doing you know one-to-one -one -one work, work. Or, until they've yeah, got yeah. a certain Got a certain point in their their training process Absolutely yeah shocking. and you know you're bringing back some memories there for me um which was i started my private practice i'd been a Ministry of Defence psychologist for seven years. So I was already chartered. And um, the, uh, you know, I, we moved to France and I set up my uh, private practice there for the first time. Now, there's a slight cross-cultural um, issue here because what happened was that my French father-in-law, who was bank manager, said... 29 years old and you think you can set up your own business like you should be in private uh, you know a, a psychologist for like 25 years before you even think about setting up your own business and you know there, I think there was an element there of I don't know if there was an aspect of gender um you know I was a mom to two small children at that point there was but there was also a kind of expectation within a, a certain cultural framework that the people who were allowed mm. to set up their own businesses were the ones that had already worked for someone else for 20 or 25 years. And the idea that me with only seven years 
<laughs> of experience working as a psychologist could go and then offer their services to somebody else. Um, and another kind of interesting story of the things that we are faced with sometimes, um, you know, to your point around how people in other businesses don't have this mindset. You know, they have a mindset, which is if you um, if you're good, you'll charge money. If your services are good, they will be expensive, right? And, and we communicate our value sometimes through the, uh, in, for some of our services, we're communicating the value or people are picking up a, a message around value um, based on uh, how much we're charging for them. And I, I remember um, starting to do a lot of executive coaching and, you know, come from a very working class background. And I was probably still shopping at kind of high street, you know, buying my suits from somewhere like Next. I don't know what that might be in the American context, but, it, you know, it, it might be, you know, something that is kind of mid range on the high street, you know, this kind of stuff. And my colleague said to me, you know, we're charging a lot of money for executive coaching from, and for executive team facilitation and so on. And, you know, with respect, you need to start looking expensive. And I remember ordering a bunch of clothes to go to my mom's house. So, and I was going to pick them up. And I, so I mean, I'm still buying ready to wear. Yeah. I'm not buying like 3000 suits or something but you know it was more expensive and I had all this stuff delivered and my mom had looked at the delivery note like she'd opened it and looked at the delivery note and she was like how much <laughs> and I, <laughs> I said to she said how much has all this cost and I was so I said well you know I think it I don't know at the time maybe I'd spent one and a half thousand pounds on I don't know three three suits and um um, I said, well, you know, my colleague said to me, we're charging a lot of money, um, so we need to show that we're expensive. And she said, well, why don't you just charge them less so you don't have to spend all this money on suits? And it was such an interesting experience because, and when I reflect on it, you know, I was the first in my family to go to university. I was the first in my family to enter a and the expectations and the stories were just they these were worlds apart and now you really see how you're navigating two different worlds mm. it was yeah it, it was a real moment of reflection for me um and it, it really stuck in my mind so <laughs> I definitely had the same experiences I, I often think the people oh, yeah? that know the people that matter will often know and notice those things um, like I wear a particular oh, yes, watch so... for a, for a right. particular reason, and those pe the people that are, who are looking at like hiring psychologists or you know bringing in executive coaches, they look at the watch and they go, "I know what that is, mm -hmm. and that is a mark of quality." That tells and therefore, it, it, it tells yeah. a story, and the way in which we portray and place ourselves in what it yeah. is we do tells a story about who we are as practitioners, almost. Um, yeah. I think that's a, it's a very interesting point. You you certainly have to look the part in in some areas. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, and Andrea, I don't know if we can put those on the expenses within the uh, business. I'm guessing not all of these things are tax deductible, right? Not all of them. No, no. Some of them will. Not all of them. But to to what you were saying, I think that there's also kind of like the demand and that will affect your pricing. I have heard, for example, marketing yeah. coaches say, increase your fee until you get a lot of resistance. And I think that yeah. nowadays, at least in the US, mental health and speaking to a therapist is something that is more open. Uh, even when I was a kid, that was not that was not a thing. You don't just go talk mm. to a therapist unless you were on a really life-threatening situation. And yeah. thankfully, that's not 
the case anymore. I know that there's, and there's, again, it's very cultural. And also here, it's not something that is, it's not a service that it's free. It costs a lot of money for the most part, it's out of pocket. So, but again, because it's more accepted, it's, it's now encouraged in a way there are businesses that will give some sort of wellness stipends to their employees and things like that, Mm. that are more, again, encouraging to the population to go and seek help when they need it. I think that has also played a role with the fees and increasing fees for private practices that are only taking private pay and not insurance. And Mm. that I think has also been a positive change. There's a lot of moving parts into it and some are good and some are bad, but I think that specifically has played a role with like talking like finance, like the demand because there's more people seeking therapists. And I want to say that COVID was a catalyst in that, uh, private practices yes. just suddenly had to close their doors and they started telehealth and that just opened the door to seeing more clients too, because you're not only have the people that can drive to your office and see you, but now you have your whole state. So in the United States, I'm not sure how things are over there, but here you have to be licensed with the state to see clients in yeah. that state. You can't see anybody else unless you're licensed in that other state. But previously, for example, I'm in Florida. I can be licensed in Florida, but if my office is here, I have only so many people in my area that will come see me. If I now have a virtual office, then I can see anybody from Florida. That literally just opened so many doors. Mm -hmm. So even without necessarily having an increased fee, you now have the possibility of having a wait list because you have more opportunity for clients. So I think that, again, that perspective of mental health and it's okay and we talk about it has also been, uh, has had a positive impact in, in, in raising those fees as well as more clients for therapy practices. Yeah, and there's so many things that come up for me listening to what you're describing there. So if I think about what was a pivotal shift for me, thinking about private practice and how we earn money in private practice. I mean, you know, I've I've done it just like everyone else has, you know, done it as well, which is we we end up sometimes delivering services on almost on a treadmill. So, you know, we get good at a thing and then we get asked to do the thing lots and lots of times. And, you know, we carry on kind of delivering these services. And um, so starting to think about how can I diversify the ways in which I earn money in my private practice? Um, Because just because we run out of, I mean, I certainly did, you know, just run out of time and energy and interest in doing the same thing over and over again for many different years. And I know we all love working with the clients. Clients always bring their unique challenges, no matter what kind of client it is. But when you've written your 4,000th assessment report, there's a limit to the number of, you know, assessment reports you can continue to write. (laughs) At least that was my experience. What really shifted my perspective was understanding that Um, So I have this, I I did, I ran this money mindset webinar in, I think, 2018 or 2019, and it was the most oversubscribed webinar that I'd run. (laughs) And within that, about you know, just this whole topic, within that, um, I came up with this metaphor, um, which was, you know, money is always flowing around the world. Um, It's a little bit like water. There's a lot of it everywhere. And it flows in certain ways. And what we're doing um, in our private practices is we are finding the stream, finding different water sources. We're building a bucket. We're going to the stream and we're taking a bucket of water out of the stream. And then actually, to your earlier point, Andrea, you know, about how we then go and resource our families and our communities with that, we're then using that water to water the garden around us, you know, 
pretty much no psychologists. I, I'm going to put a wager on this that I would say there's not many psychologists who are stashing their money in tax havens in the Cayman Islands. There might be some. I'm not going to judge you on it. I might a little bit. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but, but mostly what we're doing is we're paying for our kids. We're paying, you know, the, the local businesses in our communities. We're paying for uh, professional development. We are, you know, we are part of the lifeblood of our communities as well. And, you know, to your point about what the pandemic showed us, and, and, you know, discussions you, you and I have had, Matt, which is there is a huge market for what we do. There is an enormous, vast body of water out there for what we do. And when you see mental health platforms like those that shall remain nameless, who are very happily taking water um, uh, and redirecting some of that flow into their own tax havens, <laughs> or, you know, whether, uh, and then we start to debate how big our bucket should be, and maybe we should just have a little cup, or mm. is it all right for us to have a slightly bigger bucket? And, you know, is it okay for us to go and put this bucket in the one-to-one -one at this point, or in the, you know, the different mm. kind of areas? I mean, Matt, you and I were talking about, um, I think we had a LinkedIn discussion about the size of the market for what sports and exercise psychologists do. Yeah, I mean, it's it's um, it depends on where you look. And, and like you say, in terms of those streams of, um, mm. of, of income, uh, you know, we have at the top, you know, the professional athletes, there's what, 700 that go to Olympic Games, maybe a little bit more in the UK. Um, you might have a, you know, if you double that, that's maybe a thousand people who are kind of vying for those spots. But then you yeah. look at somebody, you know, you look at how many people play football on a Saturday morning and you then get to 7 million people who play football on a Saturday and a Sunday um, every week. So the market changes. And if you, I think there's a bit of an obsession in sports psychology with the top end, um, the mm, glitz and the yes. glamour of the top end. And I, and I can, I can see what I've worked there. So I see why it's appealing, but it's a tough environment to be in. Wendy spoke earlier about organisation of being tough to work in sporting organisations at an Olympic games time, which is like now. So we're a few months going into yeah. it is an incredibly pressured pressurized environment and as a psych in that environment you are literally balancing as many plates as you possibly can um and uh, yeah but then if you switch if you switch your your view to kind of your average saturday league footballer or your average cricketer or or who's somebody who's kind of just enjoying sport or who's somebody who wants to lose weight or somebody who wants to enjoy going to the gym a little bit more we can we can the, the market goes ever further and then if we go further into that and we say well sports psychologists do resilience training okay well who needs resilience training in the world um i mean there's lots of people in in the world that, that need yes. resilience training and we can then market that as a way of okay how do we build resilience through sport right because most sports psychologists are not just psychologists we're usually sports coaches we've been involved in sport in our entire lives so we know a lot about sport and how to use sport to create change with people so i think it depends on how you look at it but that, that market can grow and and there's certainly if you're willing to diversify around and have a think about i guess the projects that you want to work on there's definitely more opportunity yeah. if you if you look in different places yeah, yeah yeah and andrea for you and for your clients do you also see that evidence of them looking for different markets or how does that tend to work with them yeah what i've seen lately is kind of like what you were mentioning before about coaching there's a lot of conversation and, and changes into either not seeing therapy clients anymore and just becoming a coach and diving into coaching or having both. And I've also seen many therapists uh, become speakers as well. So they offer trainings to large corporations, like really big companies that will bring them to yeah. speak to their thousands or hundreds of employees. And sometimes they 
kind of like do that on, on, on a recurring basis. So I have seen a lot of therapists who are not just doing the therapy one-on-one uh, work anymore. Number one, because kind of like you were saying, it's now it's like this whole new opportunity that we didn't know it was there before. Things like you already know how to do, like you were saying, uh, Matt, with the sports, like this is things that we already do that you can just package it differently. And now it's, it's a new service. It's a new offer. But again, that comes with learning the marketing and learning how to implement that into the business. And then if we're talking about like the financial systems, now we have to incorporate all of that. So that deters a lot of people from knowing that. Um, Ah, But the ones that do, it's a great opportunity because it's things that either you're already well equipped to do it and you're just packaging it differently, or you might just Mm. find that, that this is like, it gives you that new uh, motivation. You know, you don't feel burned out because I've seen a lot of therapists that feel burned out from the same thing. Also because it's such a struggle with the pay, which is the same conversation over and over again. But this is kind of like a breath of fresh air. Like I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm serving the people around me. I'm helping them. There Mm -hmm. is change that I can see, but I am also not cutting my mortgage at risk. You know, I can also go home and take care of my garden. You know, I can take my kids to the classes that they need. I can save for my retirement, which is one of the things that it's crazy. Like, that people feel like what you're going to charge me more because you're thinking about your retirement. Yes. I have to take care of myself. I have to take care of my kids. I have to have health insurance and all of these things that that are okay for every other professional to have that. It's also okay for therapists to have. Yeah. So a few things come to mind as you're, as you're talking there, Andrea, which is, how healing it can be to bring other facets of our capability to bear in our private practice. Like, um, you know, we find that we're not, we're not just good therapists. We're not just good, you know, one-to-one coaches. We're also good trainers we and then so the the ways in which we can diversify how we support people um also has that kind of healing potential mm-hmm. because we bring more of ourselves and a more um a more wholeness yeah. of ourselves into our practices um so you know and that also makes us more resilient you know we have a more resilient kind of sense of identity then and, and a, a more well-rounded sense of our self-worth <laughs> and i mean self-worth is an enormous topic in this we could almost record a second episode you know about that uh, on, on this topic of finances and self-worth um i think the other thing that i'd love to kind of just touch on um you know is the relationship that we have with people like you andrea because what you said there about um you know empowering and enabling people to um to actually bring these new services to life you know i'm always like i've always had an accountant and the reason being, I set up when I set up my company in France in 2003, I had to be a limited company. And that meant I had to have an accountant. But fortunately for me, my accountant was really good at helping me to have an insight into the numbers in the business. Mm-hmm. And I, I literally don't know how people function without an accountant or a bookkeeper or someone to be a partner with them about the numbers And and yeah, so Andrea, what's your thought on that? I can imagine you kind of support this perspective, right? That we we need to work together as partners. Yes. And I think that there's this concept or kind of like expectation as to what the relationship with an accountant should look like. It's going to look boring and it's going to look like somebody's pointing their finger at you, telling you all the things that you did wrong. And it's going to be somebody calling you every month to ask you for your statements, which I do. (laughs) Yeah, like they're pointing their finger at you, but as a partner, but the reality can be different. The reality is very different. I'm sure that there's going to be people that behave that way, but the reality is that 
we are also in a position of wanting to serve you. We are also in a position of wanting to see your business succeed. And we have your best interests yeah. at heart. Um, obviously, I can't speak for everybody, but um, that that is a motivation that, at least for me, and uh, motivated me to come and, and choose to be doing what I'm doing because I know that my skills can yeah. help a business owner really kind of like make it. So yeah, I think it's necessary and important that you shop around and look for an accountant that you kind of like don't roll your eyes at, you know? I want you to be comfortable, you know, calling and asking a question, sending an email, because ultimately all the work and all the math and the, and the forms and, and, and the things that we do, all of that information is for the business owner to understand how they're managing their finances. That is crucial for any business yeah. owner. I need to know how I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. And I need to know that not just when I file my taxes, I need to do that. I need to know that all the time. I need to know how last month went. Yeah. I need to compare that with last year. I need to think about how the plan that I have in the future is going to affect my finances today. I need to know if how much I should have in my savings with this, this enough, what happens if COVID, you know, yeah. all of these moving parts. And you're not learning those skills when you go to school. So it's it's yeah. so beneficial to work with somebody at some capacity to have that guidance, even if it's, for example, in the start, you're gonna start your practice or you have a practice, but you don't have a system in place to talk to somebody to, that can guide you on how to set those up so that that yeah. can kind of like keep going. And ultimately you can get that information that you need. And at least over here, we have uh, HIPAA compliance. So what that means is like the, the client yeah. information is completely separate from accounting and the way that you keep track of your accounting records should be separate from that. So working with somebody that is aware of that and that won't get your client's information, let's say into QuickBooks, it's very important as well. So mm. asking questions when you're looking for somebody, number one, that they are familiar mm. with small business owner accounting or finance or tax is so important because that is going to be so different from corporate accounting and corporate mm -hmm. tax. Yeah, yeah, that's And true. number two, yeah, yeah. with yeah, somebody yeah. that is familiar with the industry that will at least know the very basics of differentiating and keeping separate your client information and your accounting records. Yeah, definitely. Matt, I saw you nodding vigorously about the importance of working with accountants have you found something similar yeah so um i i actually don't work with a, an accountant at the present moment but i've spent a lot of time with accountants in the past um so my systems are now set up where i i can kind of let them just roll over um but if my if my business grows and i start adding new projects and stuff in then there's definitely going to have to be and i'm going to have to re-consult with an accountant to to bring that in so i tend to bring in specialists when i need them as opposed to have them rolling over all the time um, but in the past especially when i set up it was having an accountant to to talk me through what i needed to do uh, talk me through what what i needed to keep records of how that all needed to be submitted and i i did have an accountant for almost eight years who did all my accounting for me um but actually after after a bit of time i kind of got to grips with it myself and and Thankfully, my business is quite streamlined, so it makes it quite easy to do the accounting. But other than that, yeah, I, I try to bring experts in when, when I need them. Well, I think that's a really smart approach. I know I just never want to do that. <laughs> so even if I could, I'm just like, yeah, <laughs> I'd much rather the accountant talk me through it uh, and be able to kind of rely on rely on them. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I I always feel like accountants, bookkeepers, the people who can help us with our finances, you know, you get kind of much maligned for being, you know, the people who are looking after the pennies and, and everything. And for me, I just, the, the power of having someone who can have a really meaningful conversation with you about the finances in your business, 
is such an empowering conversation to have. So I'm very mindful about time and I've just enjoyed this conversation so much. Um, I guess I've got a couple of questions. Matt, you described there, you know, how you've streamlined your business. But I'm just wondering, on reflection, that streamlining of the financial systems in your practice, have there been any ways in which that supported your financial well-being and helped you to have a more healthy relationship with money? And I'm just, yeah, just wondering about that. I I spent a lot of time sort of building my relationship with money, I think, and getting comfortable with charging higher figures, which was, which is, you know, is, is hard enough as it is. There was a couple of episodes in my career that I've come across life coaches who are charging obscene amounts of money for very small amounts of work and and I kind of just thought why why can't I do that um and then did a little behavior experiment <laughs> I tried it out myself and it worked uh, once and then I did another one and it worked out the second time and kind of just used a bit of psychology on myself to to see how this would go um so that kind of built my own financial well-being <laughs> yes. and i kind of would, would would definitely recommend that that people try these things out you know okay it doesn't work once doesn't work maybe it doesn't work a couple of times but invariably you will get to a point where you you know if it doesn't work once is that going to be a, that big of a deal um probably not so yeah and i, and I think having Having certainly having some confidence over what is co coming in and going out is is definitely uh, important. Like having some oversight on that yeah. and knowing exactly what is going in and going out at any given time is really important. And I, I always surprise myself that when I look yeah. into my accounts and I find something, I'm like, what is that reoccurring payment that's been going out for like the past year? Um, and, and I sit and think, I've not seen that for, for a very long time. I need to go and check what that is and just make sure that that's still doing what it should be doing. Um, I, I kind of have a purge every year or so to make sure that those those kind of payments are not happening. Yeah. That, I, find, I find purging costs can be a very healing experience. <laughs> Andrea, what have you seen in terms of the kind of health and life giving um, uh, benefits of streamlining your financial systems? Going after what like what uh, Matt was saying was confidence. I think that a lot of yeah. people, when they're first starting out, and even if they have years as business owners, what they're looking for is that feeling of confidence, like. I got this. Like I know what is going on and I know what choices I need to make in my business. But confidence is not like this kind of like, oh, now I feel confident. You know, like now I got here suddenly. It's just like this magical feeling. Mm. It comes with practice and it comes with a lot of mistakes and it comes with adjusting and tweaking. So I think that when you are intentional about setting your systems up and being aware of what's going where and the reason behind it, not just because my bookkeeper told me, but because I understand what is happening kind of like behind the scenes so that I can see how mm. I'm managing my money. Not only it's kind of like you're gaining points, like, oh, now I understand this. It points to your confidence, like, a uh, bucket. Okay, now I feel a little better because now I understand why. And oh, I ran yeah. a profit and loss report. Oh, that wasn't so hard. That was one of the things that one of my clients uh, did, for example, like a few meetings ago, she was like, hey, I just wanted to let you know that I went into QuickBooks and I ran my profit and loss on my own for the first time. And we had been working for <laughs> over a year and that was a really big step for her. She didn't, she was so anxious about yeah. it. She had um, not a great uh, experience with the previous accountant. So those are little steps towards the right direction. So now it's kind of like, okay, she can yeah. do that without feeling terrified. <laughs> That's the goal. You know, I want you to yeah. not feel terrified. Yeah. And then we, move that milestone you know or, or we work towards the next yeah. milestone once you yeah. got here now what can we work towards so it's not like this one yeah. destination it's not like okay now i know this it's 
it's little steps that you have to be mindful. It does take time. It does take effort. It takes being intentional. Yeah. It takes putting things in your calendar on, on repeat, like every Friday or every two Fridays or at least once a month, I'm going to categorize my stuff. If you're doing it on your own or if you're working with a bookkeeper, send all my stuff to my bookkeeper or book that meeting with my accountant so that we can look at my numbers together. Like it does take effort mm. and it does take time, but it doesn't have to be really difficult. And that's the goal. The goal is mm. to, mm. after you try things out and you're adjusting as they work or not work, that it becomes a little bit more effortless, that the, the yeah, workings yeah. and the apps and the spreadsheets and all the moving parts feel a little bit more effortless so that you can grab that information. And the more that you look at your financial yeah. reports, the easier it gets to read them and to understand them. You know, the first times, it yeah, could take yeah. years and that's totally fine too. As long as you're moving towards that, you look at your financial reports yeah, yeah. and usually it's like, I don't even know what this means. You know, like I never go in there because I don't know what it means. <laughs> And then after some time of practicing that is like, oh yeah, you know, I just looked at my balance sheet and I saw that. And that only comes with practice and that practice will bring yeah, that yeah. confidence. Yeah. And I, I, I'm now thinking to myself, you know what? We ended up changing accountancy package and we changed over to zero. And I find zero just I'm like oh I just don't, I don't like the dashboard I don't like the thing it's all very unfamiliar and now I'm like you know what that's a little growth edge for you to go and kind of <laughs> you know work on yourself Wendy to go and get comfortable with zero again <laughs> yeah because so thank you Andrew you kind of made me feel self-accountable <laughs> there that's <laughs> good said. and all of those apps matter you know I usually tell people if they're just starting yeah. out and they don't know like should I do zero should I do QuickBooks and I'm like look one of the easiest things that you can do like you don't even have to sign up for the free trial go into YouTube, look up a tutorial for like how to categorize transactions in my bank yeah. feed. And just, you can literally see it play out. Sometimes it's colors that people are like, oh my God, it's just so awful. I can't look at this. And sometimes it's like, you know, I like how this looks, the dashboard and all of this. Ultimately, especially for a private practice, the the software like between QuickBooks or Zero or any another or another one, it's not going to be that different. You don't have inventory you don't have you know like all of these really more complicated mm, levels yes. of yeah, accounting yeah. Yeah, of yeah. accounting so as long as you can track and you can have your bank feeds connected which is going you know taking advantage of the technology and as long as you can reconcile your accounts every month and you can pull those yeah. reports your balance sheet your profit and loss and your statement of cash flows everything else is more of a preference. And if you're not okay with mm -hmm. how that feels, that's okay. You can change it or you could spend an afternoon being okay with it so that, or, or playing with it so that you can feel okay with it. But ultimately that's okay. just one tool in, in a whole uh, drawer of different items and tools that, that are going to help you get better at it. Yeah. Well, I love this conversation. And as I said, I, um, I feel like that there should be an episode 2B, <laughs> uh, you know, a, a, a kind of follow-up epi episode to this because it's such an important and central uh, kind of topic. Could I um, ask you where we can find you on the internet, please? Andrea, where can we find you? Yes, I, I'm mostly hanging out on LinkedIn. So you just Google, I'm not Google, you just put my name, Andrea Rotondo, in there. I'm usually having conversations in there or posting like tips or videos on how to help you kind of like systematize things better or what to look for in your private practice. You can also find me on Instagram, uh, andrea.rotondo. But again, it, you'll find me more on LinkedIn. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. And thanks so much for being here today. And Matt, where can we find you on the internet? 
Uh, yeah, so uh, just Google Matt Cunliffe, sports psychologist. That's pr- usually a good way. Um, but directly would be sportspsychologyken.co.uk or through LinkedIn. Um, yeah. It's another good place to find me as well. So. Thank you so much, both of you, for this uh, conversation. I'm just really um, looking forward to the kind of discussion that comes out of this, you know, the discussion in the comments, the discussion on social media that we get, because I think it's just such an enormous topic. And and yet it's so central to the success and health of our private practices and as, you know, us as private practitioners as well. So thank you both for being here today. So I found this such an important and inspiring conversation to have with Matt and Andrea, because even though we're coming at this topic of financial well-being and kind of the relationship that we have with money in our practices, you know, we're coming at it from very different perspectives, but um, there are so many challenges that all of us face as psychologists, um, you know, and how we relate to how we charge for our services, how we create income streams. And, you know, that taps into so many facets around our identity, around topics like self-worth, around topics like the relationship that we have with our families or other people, um, and and even the way in which kind of um, our money impacts on the relationship that we have with clients, like, you know, what we charge and what that says to clients and how that kind of influences how we uh, show up as psychologists or how we actually do the work. And the thing that really came home to me, though, is all of this complexity is made more difficult because we don't talk about it. (laughs) Uh, And I'm thinking about how, you know, so much of breaking the mold of private practice is really about having some of those conversations and speaking for some of those things that have been unspoken. Um, I would love to see more financial education of Gosh, you know, starting back in, uh, you know, as Andrea was talking about how even as teenagers in high school or, you know, secondary school or wherever, um, how we are not, I mean, certainly I wasn't, I don't know for my, you know, now adult children, whether they, I don't think they were even taught in school about this idea of how do we create a financial income for ourselves that goes beyond just being an employee. You know, to me, this is really central kind of piece of information that we're missing. And when I think about our much more professional or vocational training around that, like, again, we need to think about that and, you know, start to start to educate young people and people coming into the profession about what it means um, to create an income stream, how to create a business model, how to charge for what we offer, how to explore what that looks like and how we position ourselves in the market. Because otherwise, we're not communicating, you know, there are the very important ways in which we're not communicating the value of what we do. Um to broader society. And I think that can disempower us. On the flip side, when we learn more about how to do that, actually, you know, we can, it can be a very empowering experience. Um, You know, when we start to realize we can have powerful conversations with people like our accountants, or maybe ultimately with, you know, family, friends, colleagues, investors, etc., about the value that we create, um, that can be an incredibly empowering place to be. And so I guess, yeah, what what I'm reflecting on is how um how the still for me anyway, um how I'm still enjoying the evolution of this story of my own relationship with um, money and value and earning and financial well-being um, as somebody in private practice. So I hope you've enjoyed this journey and I'm looking forward to your reflections, your comments, 
Um, yeah, let me know what you thought. Bye, everyone. Until next time. Have you experienced a toxic workplace or felt drained, disillusioned or isolated in your practice? Perhaps it's time to transform your professional journey. Our Practice Accelerator and coaching programs are crafted to help you create a thriving practice aligned with your well-being and values. If you're curious about what this could look like for you, visit our website and explore how we can support you in building a fulfilling and sustainable practice. You don't have to navigate this alone. Let's thrive together. Join us at inspiringpsych.com. That's inspiringpsych.com.